So all have sinned. That's the conclusion that Paul has been working toward in Romans for nearly two chapters now. Today, he'll wrap up the argument by supporting it from the Old Testament. But, but we really don't need Paul to prove this to us. A few minutes on the internet, a few minutes with a newspaper will glaringly show the depth of the sin that pervades our culture as it has every human culture in history. On Monday, I googled Houston crime. The first hit showed the Chronicle's crime page with these headlines. Family of Arlene Alvarez calls for an end to gun violence against Houston's children. Nine-year-old gunned down during Houston robbery is among several children killed on Houston streets in recent weeks. Next one, one person dead, another hurt in shootings near downtown. Next one, authorities find human remains in northwest Houston. Authorities found human remains in a wooded area of northwest Houston Friday as they were searching for the body of a 35-year-old man who was reported missing late last month. Next one, a 19-year-old boy has been accused of the death of an 11-year-old boy who was fatally shot earlier this month at a Northeast Harris County apartment complex. Sin is pervasive. Next one, a Houston couple was indicted on charges of capital murder Thursday in connection with the March 2021 death of an 8-year-old boy, according to the Harris County District Attorney. So then I googled robbery, Friendswood, and though older, there was no shortage of these. The best was, Friendswood police searched for suspects in Ace Hardware chainsaw robbery, which was not, you know, a chainsaw massacre. It, it was stealing chainsaws from Ace Hardware. Right? Another head, headline read, suspect accused of Friendswood robbery crime spree. And, and the article said, Friendswood police are breathing a sigh of relief after getting Jose Luis Perez off the streets. Perez is accused of committing multiple armed robberies in the Friendswood area. So it's local, but it's also global. I mean, on a larger scale, I keep thinking of the Boy Scouts. At this point, over 100,000 people have come forward claiming sexual abuse in Boy Scouting. Almost all of that abuse was by adult leaders, and the average age of the victims was 12. Then, of course, there's war. Just this week, Russia has begun this war against the neighboring country of Ukraine, and once again, innocent people are under the lash of modern weaponry. The BBC reported that between 169,000 and 190,000 Russian troops are involved in this, in this war that's broken out, uh, coming, coming both from Russia and neighboring Belarus. Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, said that this would be the biggest war in Europe since 1945. Now, does this prove that all have sinned? No, but it does remind us that human sin is pervasive. No day passes when human sin is not the most dominant force in human events. What rarely makes the news is all the sin that occurs un underneath the headlines. Almost every family in almost every workplace, there is sin. Not abuse necessarily or violence, but anger, manipulation, sexual infidelity and pornography, plus just plain and simple selfishness, looking out for ourselves rather than others. Add on top of that the many times that we know that God would have us do some positive good, and we don't do that. And when you put it all together, the theory that all have sinned seems all too plausible. Paul has been telling us that since Romans 1.18. To complete his argument, he provides a long list of quotes from the Old Testament, the authoritative scriptures of the Old Testament. And what we're seeing today is that the evidence of scripture and the evidence of experience points to this truth that all have sinned. So our outline says first that all are under sin. 
Romans 3, 9 through 12. Then we learn that we are sinful in every part, Romans 3, 13 to 18. And finally, we learn that as a result of this sin, all are held accountable to God, Romans 3, 19 and 20. So let's begin with Romans 3, 9, to, 9 through 12. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The translation of verse 9 requires a small judgment call. The, the Greek there simply says, what then? Are we better off? Most translations just go with that, but it leaves us wondering who the we is. But remember that the chapter began by asking what advantage the Jews had, and Paul's initial response was, much in every way. Yet in terms of being judged justly for their sin, the Jews have no advantage, despite having the word of God, despite having the covenant of circumcision. So in context, the English Standard Version is probably right to have Paul saying there, are we Jews any better off? Now he says, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, and that includes everybody, that's comprehensive, all are under sin. Douglas Moose says, we have then, in this statement, Paul's own comment on his purpose in this section of his letter. All people who have not experienced the righteousness of God by faith are under sin. That is, they are helpless captives to its power. Nothing that Paul has said suggests that there are exceptions to this rule, and nothing shows more clearly the desperate need for the message of the gospel. For the problem with people is not just that they commit sins. Their problem is that they are enslaved to sin. Jesus himself said it. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. What's needed, therefore, is a new power to break in and set people free from sin. And that power is found in, found only in, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that follows immediately now this section we're studying. But here in verse 10, Paul begins to substantiate this truth with quotations from the Old Testament. And by the way, the scripture page in today's bulletin has all the Old Testament references uh, from these next several verses. So the first part of verse 10 is the general heading. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. So that's the first of a series of phrases that Paul takes from Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. Familiar verses. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good not even one. Well, the psalm says that. None who does good, not even one. Paul, in his first phrase, modifies it a little. He says, there is none who is righteous. No, not one. It seems like a pretty big difference at first between doing good and being righteous, but Paul probably makes this substitution for two good reasons. First, Though it does sound like a big difference, the two categories, none who does good and none who is righteous, those two truths overlap by pretty much 100%. Second, righteous is Paul's big word in Romans. We've heard him talk about God's judgment of unrighteousness. We've heard him say that, that God is revealing a righteousness from heaven. And so Paul picks that up and says, yeah, I can use that word in my summary. But it does go on to the phrase that's actually in Psalm 14, no one does good, down in verse 12 of our text. So here's the picture that the psalmist is painting. God looks down from heaven to see if there are any who understand, who retain enough conscience and enough consciousness of God to seek after him. But Paul says, the psalmist says, no one does. Again, this goes back to chapter 1, 
Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. No one understands. Verse 11, no one understands, no one seeks for God. And this doesn't mean, by the way, that people aren't religious, but it means people's religion is human-centered, distorted, and idolatrous. Again, we saw it in chapter 1. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And if we continue to follow the path laid out in chapter 1, this ultimately led to the things we saw in, in the news headlines that we, that we just rehearsed. Evil, covetousness, malice, of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. We could have gone on Monday or whatever day of this week right, and examined that day's headlines and found each of these sins exhibited around us in the world. Therefore, Paul concludes, quoting Psalm 14 almost word for word, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good not even one. Now, now, let me make sure that we don't take Paul, that we don't take the psalmist the wrong way. It's not that people don't do some good some of the time. It's that they don't do all good all the time. Uh, the basic attitude of their heart at some level is turned aside from God to self, even when doing good from time to time is the fulfillment of their self-desire. But that turning aside from God is the summary, not only of these verses, but of everything from Romans 1.18 to this point. All have sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. So, you know, thought problem, <laughs> thought example. If you were to gather the hundred greatest statesmen of all time and examine their lives and their hearts, you would find sinful thoughts and actions and rebellion against God in all of them. If you were to gather the hundred greatest philanthropists of all time, you, who, who gave great amounts of, of money for, to others, you would find selfishness and sin in all of them. If you were to gather the hundred most faithful and devoted Christians of all time, you would find sin in all of them, and that all of them had sinned. Now, there would be a difference. The difference would be that the believers have received the free gift of forgiveness and cleansing from God. But that doesn't mean that they were not sinners because all have sinned. That's why they needed the rescue. So, with this quote from Psalm 14, which is also paralleled in Psalm 53, by the way, Paul has shown that the teaching of the Old Testament confirms the universality of sin. But he's not ready to stop yet. And right at the moment, we don't want him to. In verses 13 to 18, he shows from Scripture that all of us are sinful in every part. So verse 13, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood in their paths of ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So the list begins with the organs of speech, pretty much in the sequence of speech, throat, tongue, lips, mouth. Their throat, he says first, is an open grave. That phrase and the next are from Psalm 5, verse 9. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. The speech of those without God is like a mass grave full of rotting bodies under a hot sun. That's how devastating our sinful words are to other people. Yet even those who have never robbed murdered or committed adultery, have said hurtful, angry, condemning 
words to others. And we all know people who make this kind of speech their common, common practice. And it's sad, but it's the sin that pervades the world. They use their tongues to deceive, Paul says. We've also all known people who were good at spinning a story, sounding sincere, convincing us their words were true, but not keeping their words. In crisis response, the classic example is the contractor who comes along to some poor needy homeowner and says, yeah, I can repair your house for $10,000, but I'll need it up front to buy the materials. And you give them the money, you never see them again. But this, this sin of deceit goes all the way up to world leaders, as we've seen even this week, and it also goes all the way down, even to people in your own family, even to your own soul. The last phrase in verse 13, the venom of asps is under their lips, is from Psalm 140, another Psalm of David, describing evil people. They make their tongue sharp as a servant's, serpents, and under their lips is the venom of asps. This is an apt description of the poison that seems to enter our veins, seems to enter our souls when we're lied to and deceived and mocked and belittled. Just as poison works by destroying vital tissues, condemnation works by destroying vital self-understandings. We find ourselves saying, so-and-so must be right. I am ugly. I am slow. I am stupid. I'm no good. Words like that from people who ought to be protecting and nurturing us are life devastating. Verse 14, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Again, Paul's quoting from the Psalms, Psalm 10, verse 7, describing the wicked person. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and an epity. So whenever I talk about these tongue sections of Scripture, which we'll, we'll hear a couple in a minute, I think of the time that I parked in the Walmart parking lot, and when I opened the door, I heard this string of curses and yelling, a woman berating someone in the most foul language. And when I looked over, I saw a large unattractive woman leaning over a five- or six-year-old little girl, squeezing her arm and unloading this poison in her face. To my shame, I didn't say anything, and I still wish I had. But it's that kind of cruelty that condemns humankind. We all remember what James said. So also, the tongue is a small member Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no person can tame can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know that our tongue, we have used our words to hurt others. Jesus said it too. And in his characteristic way, he took it further internally to the heart. In Matthew 15, 10, he said, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. And a few verses later, he explained, Are you all still, sorry, it was plural. Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Our tongues and our sins are a reflection of the corruption of our hearts. And all of Scripture, all of Scripture testifies to this. 
a Russian poet named Turgenev said this perfectly. He said, I don't know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it is terrible. Let me read that again. I really like it. I don't know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like. It's terrible. But even there, Paul doesn't stop, though by this time we might really like him to stop. We think he's proved his point. But he goes on in the next verses to give what R. Kent Hughes says could be a condensed history of the world. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood in their paths of ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And this is a quote from Isaiah 59, although once again Paul is using the Greek version rather than the Hebrew, so it may not read exactly like that in our Bibles. But the thrust is the same as Isaiah 59, their feet are swift to shed blood. Notice now Paul switches from the mouth to the feet, from words to ways and actions. And the history of the world affirms violence as the trademark of humankind, affirms ruin and misery, affirms verse 17, that people do not know, do not follow the way of peace. Whether we're talking about war on the national level, as we've seen this week, or on the tribal level, or the gang wars in our cities, or the relational wars in our families, violence has been the continuous fruit of the fall since Cain murdered Abel. The latest, of course, this week is the war in Ukraine. It's a fascinating country. I'll give you a little background on this that you may not all have heard. It's a country tremendously rich in resources, mineral, agricultural, and industrial. It has been the focus of wars for centuries. So ignoring the czars, starting in 1920, the people of Ukraine, seeking to be a separate Soviet state, were brutally crushed by the Red Army. Then in the 1930s, Stalin attempted to feed Russia on the backs of the Ukrainians leading to the Holodomor, the death by famine, which is what that word means, of 7 to 10 million Ukrainians. In 1941, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union and overran Ukraine. Originally hailed as liberators, the Germans soon showed themselves to be as brutal as the Soviets, killing and starving millions of Ukrainians, including an estimated 1.5 million Jews. Ukrainian was turned against Ukrainian as Germany recruited Jew and Soviet-hating Ukrainians to terrorize their own countrymen. After the war, Ukraine was again a a puppet state of the Soviet Union. Is it any wonder then that Ukraine sought independence after the collapse of communism? Yet regions on the Russian border continued to engage in violent separatist movements that have provided part of the excuse for Putin to bomb and invade the whole country, as he's done. But but recognize, folks, that that's just one small, small, tiny portrait of one episode in the violent and deadly history of the world and of humankind. As R. Kent Hughes says, man's depravity is seen in this rush to violence. And Hughes quotes Will Brandt's famous conclusion in his book, Lessons from History. In the last 3,420 years of recorded history, only 268 have seen no war. But I'm sure that if you counted tribal and gang conflict, (laughs) even those 268 years were filled with violence. And there have been no years since, Will Durant wrote, without violence and the shedding of innocent blood. Why is this? I mean, murder is abhorrent to most of us. Uh, We have that law written in our hearts uh, that, that we shall not murder. Yet time after time, people have justified the dehumanization of other people the dehumanization of groups, so that violence and murder becomes not only thinkable, but embraced. 
It's still happening today. It's not just Hitler. It's not just Stalin. It's not even just Putin. It's still happening today. And the increasing polarization in Western culture is not a good sign. Because as, as you dehumanize the people on the other side, you too can be lured into violence and murder. You know, folks, it's almost as if there is something drastically broken in the makeup of human nature. The reason that no one is righteous, Paul says, is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 18. Final quote from Psalm 36. Transgression speaks to the wicked, wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. The heart is corrupt, and the eye, which should see God in creation and in Scripture and thus fear him and cry out to him in repentance, does not do so. We know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the lack of fear is the gateway to corruption, to violence, to bloodshed, to oppression, to abuse and bitterness and harm. And again, we wish Paul were finished. Okay, Paul, we've got this. We're convinced that the world is under sin, but he's got one more thing to remind us of, that all sinners are accountable to God, verses 19 and 20. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul is using the word law here to refer to the whole of the Old Testament, but really to that list of verses we just studied. Yeah, and since these quotations were from the Psalms, and one of them from Isaiah, the law doesn't mean the law of Moses. It means the teaching of the Old Testament, which we've just reviewed. Paul's point is that anyone who has taught the Scripture here in these verses would have to take them seriously. God himself accuses each person individually of being under sin, enslaved to sin, being shown guilty by the words they have uttered, being shown guilty by the acts they have done, and being shown guilty by the rebellion and selfishness of their hearts. And this truth applies to both Jews and Gentiles. It's interesting. The actual scriptures quoted in verses 10 to 12, they were explicitly addressed to the whole world. The whole world is foolish like this. While many of the verses quoted in verses 13 to 17, they were addressed to the Gentile enemies of the Jews, finding them guilty. And the final verse, verse 18, is applied in scripture both to Jews and to Gentiles, that there is no fear of God before their eyes. So the accusation, even from the Old Testament, is a universal accusation. And the purpose of this convicting scriptural testimony, Paul says, is that every mouth might be stopped and that the whole world be held accountable to God. So the vocabulary, according to Douglas Moo, is that of the courtroom. Shutting the mouth refers to the defendant who has no more to say in the responses that are to the charges that are brought before him or her. The Greek word translated accountable occurs nowhere else in scriptures, but is used in other Greek writings to mean answerable to, liable to prosecution. So Paul pictures God uh, both as the one offended and as the judge who weighs the evidence and pronounces the verdict. We are accountable to him for this sinful behavior. So, you know, the, the final image here is of all humanity standing before God, accountable to him for willful and inexcusable violations of his will. Standing before him with our mouths shut, nothing to say, <laughs> nothing by which to defend ourselves, awaiting the sentence of condemnation that these sins, these words, these actions deserve. Verse 20, 
For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul's already proved his point, but he goes back and he repeats this one important element. You can't be declared righteous by starting to obey the law or trying to obey the law, either by the law, the law of Moses or the larger behavioral burden of the scriptures or the laws that are written on your hearts. Now, perfect good works in response to this law would justify you. Paul's already said that to us. But now he has shown that nobody does perfect good works. Furthermore, future good works do not erase the sin you've already done and do not balance the sin. It's not a balanced system. In fact, Paul says the law, even the law written on our hearts, all aspects of the law, the primary purpose is to point out the sin that you do do. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So there we are. We made it. Beginning in Romans 1.18, we've processed bad news for Gentiles, bad news for Jews. The fact that none of our excuses is valid validates our sin, and the fact that Scripture and also experience prove that all have sinned. Now, I'm going to be out of the pulpit for the next two Sundays, not entirely to keep you waiting, but that's the way it's turned out. When we come back, we'll finally look directly at the good news, the but God, as David said this morning, that we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We've reached the nadir, the low point, and we're moving on to find that God has a plan to rescue us from the bad news. We've talked today about many sins. Some of them we may resonate with, for example, with the behavior of our tongues. Some of them feel unthinkable to us, war or body violence. But I want to close with a thought about the pervasiveness of sin from Jackie Hill Perry's relatively new book about God's holiness. It says, the soil from which all sin grows is unbelief. In other words, she's saying the foundational sin that all have sinned is unbelief. We sin because that is our nature to do so, but it's not as if we always sin unintentionally, like depraved robots without the ability to behave according to reason. We are thoughtful with our rebellion. There is a level of reasoning within us when we decide which golden calf we'll love on any given day. With that said, the foundation of our idolatry, the sin begetting all others, is a specific belief about God. Our perverse sexual ethics, wild tongue, religious superiority, dark thoughts, legalistic postures, mean ways, impatient moods, greedy antics, intellectual arrogance, and rebellious tendencies, all of these come out of what we believe about the living God. We do one or all of the above when we have made the decision not to believe, trust, acknowledge, or depend on who God has revealed himself to be. Yet, do you get that? <laughs> when we sin, it's because we've made the decision not to trust God as he has revealed himself to be. This, in a sense, is the foundational sin, is unbelief. And the reason God can judge us is because he's holy, he's perfect, he's good, he is always right and always righteous. We sin when we don't believe that his righteousness counts, makes a difference. We sin when we don't believe that he's really as good or pure as he claims to be. We sin when we place our perceived needs and our ways of getting them met above his promises and his character. We sin when we refuse to put our creator first and ourselves second. This is foundational to the, to the truth that all have sinned, this stands behind the individual sins that we're all guilty of. Unbelief. But God is 
bigger than our unbelief. There is good news. God has provided the way out from our sins, and it comes through belief, faith. God has shown utter and overwhelming righteousness by giving us the opportunity to be right in his sight by punishing our sins in Jesus and thus fulfilling every definition of justice. And so we sin still today when we choose not to believe, not to acknowledge, not to trust, not to depend on who God has revealed himself to be in Jesus. And we are saved when we choose to believe, trust, acknowledge, and depend on God as revealed in the saving sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. That's the good news for all of us who are the all who have sinned.